Hey, what's up everybody? So yep, addressing the elephant in the room, uh, I was hacked but it's okay now, it's all good. This is no longer a Tesla slash Elon Musk crypto channel, sad times. Anyway, we're back with the new Guild Wars 2 patch, so it's time to review it. As you all know, uh, I wasn't super impressed with the previous patch. While the new map was cool, the story felt pretty scant despite being well written and well voice acted. And the meta event overall was, was okay, except I found the final boss to be a little repetitive. We got some cool new rewards like new weapons, a handful of new skins, etc. All neat stuff, but there's no doubt the content patch still felt light overall, and I feel like that was the general sentiment regarding the patch as well. Now, I was holding out hope that this was a one-off, that the next patch would surely feel more substantial. There'd be another half of the map to explore, a new final boss for the meta event, new rewards, story, a fractal. I was pretty sure that while this patch fell short, the next one would be a banger update as we conclude the End of Dragons story. So, did ArenaNet deliver? Let's start with the story. Um, this was funnily enough my favourite part of the patch. So we find out that the demons we discovered in the last patch are drawn to trauma and negative emotion. We formulate a plan to take advantage of this in order to draw the demons out, but doing so would require us to embrace that trauma. So one of the first things we do is we go on a brief little side quest across Tyria to come to terms with some of our past traumas. Uh, I enjoyed this stuff quite a bit actually. Um, you first get a reminder of my Trin and her path to redemption before she... The commander actually comments on how we still don't forgive her for what she's done, which I appreciated because I really felt like we swept it under the rug after End of Dragons. I really liked that we got to pick which memories of characters we wanted to revisit. I picked Blish, of course, as well as Aureen, which was kind of weird because like, she's not dead. She's just hanging out somewhere. Like she's still around, we can go see her. But anyway, yeah, nevertheless, I did enjoy this bit, especially the stuff with Blish. That said, I do think this sequence could have been a little meatier. You kind of just teleport to these locations, get like 30 seconds of dialogue and then TP to the next one. And once you're done, that's it. It's implied you've overcome your trauma now and you're good to go. I feel like we as players don't get enough time to really process all this, but I mean, it is what it is. There's only so much you could do uh, with this short of a runtime. Moving on, the rest of the episode up until the finale is a lot of dialogue, a lot of collecting things and just sort of running back and forth and then some more dialogue. But honestly, I didn't mind it. And maybe this is a hot take, but I would like more of this in the future. I enjoyed getting to know these characters better. And I think the banter is mostly well-written, especially with Rama. I don't think we need constant action. In fact, the combat sequences during the personal story are usually pretty weak anyway because they need to cater to every kind of player. So yeah, I don't mind the story being mostly just dialogue. Anyway, Rama learns how to become an earthbender in like five minutes and so begins our plan to lure the demons from the depths, seal them out and exterminate them once and for all on the surface. So onto the finale of the story. We use Gorik and Taimi's device thingy to to draw out the demons. Rama almost succumbs to the nightmares, but we help him through it, and the first wall is sealed behind the Oni. We then repeat that through a bunch of rooms, one of them dealing with Yao and Chulmu's relationship, which I also enjoyed, all while the giant Oni chases us through the tunnel and we seal the walls behind him. This stuff, uh, I didn't mind at all. I knew that it was mostly just gonna be through this tunnel, but I think the narrative beats hit well. And there was this sense of urgency because, you know, Oni are spawning in and chasing us through. I enjoyed it. So then we get to the big boss. Uh, it's a big purple oni sticking out of the ground. I feel like the actual arena for this fight to take place was kind of underwhelming considering how cool the underground boss arena looks. I mean, it's literally just a random flat area out in the open, but you know, it is what it is. Same deal here. We just sort of break crystals to charge our device in order to zap the boss. Uh, and then we use the power of positive vibes and friendship and memories to damage and eventually kill it. Um, as cheesy as this was, 
Again, I didn't really mind it. I don't expect any real combat depth from these story bosses, even though we've gotten that in the past. They're more or less just narrative beats. Uh, it was a fun spectacle. Uh, you got to Hadouken the boss a few times with your positive vibes. It was okay as a final boss to this story chapter. The high intensity action music didn't stop playing when I beat the boss while I was talking to everyone. They were like, oh, it's over, but the music's still playing. Um, don't think that was intentional, but but oh well, didn't really ruin it for me. It was a solid sequence. So had the episode ended there, I would have felt a bit eh, but what followed was a cute little cherry on top. Rama asked his assistant out on a date, but wants us to come for emotional support. Gorik and Taimi have decided to go together. And so naturally we've got to bring a date as well. Uh, no option to bring a lady except for a bird person we talked to like two times, but that's okay because of course I'm picking your boy Kanak anyway. What came next was basically an awkward first date uh, ripped straight from a rom-com. I loved it. It was very sweet to see Gorik and Taimi together. The line delivery and comedic timing during this whole scene was great. I was honestly smiling from ear to ear the entire time. Genuinely, one of my favorite scenes in the game's entire history. I can't explain it. I just, I really enjoyed it a lot. I love rom-coms. And yeah, I definitely had a lot of laughs during this sequence. So that's the story. That kind of wraps up End of Dragons, I suppose. Um, if I combine the story of this patch and the previous one together, you know, it, it doesn't rank up there with the better stories we've had, but it wasn't bad either. I've heard complaints that the dialogue is too quippy, uh, everything happened too fast, that there was no central villain, and that's all justified. You know, the story of these two patches definitely felt quite detached from the End of Dragons story. Like, it basically has zero correlation other than it being set in Canther. That said, I'm just treating it for what it is. It's a short filler story to take a little break before the next big event. So I was feeling pretty good about the patch by this point. Uh, the story took us about an hour and a half, so not too bad. If we combine that with the previous story, you know, it's like two and a half hours, three hours. That's like a normal Living World episode. I think the fact that it was just split over two patches didn't feel great. Anyway, it was now time to revisit the meta event. Now, I was already a little disappointed that the only new area that was added to this zone was this tunnel. Uh, I saw the rumors, I was a non-believer, but the tunnel theory was correct, and we do indeed just get a tunnel. But I was not prepared for this. Um, let me give you a play-by-play -play of my experience. We joined a group basically just starting the meta event. We fight our way down the cave through the usual events, completely unchanged. Wasn't expecting any changes really, but it would have been nice. Nevertheless, we push the event all the way to the end and kill the demon trio. So at this point, we're about 40 minutes into the event, but now the new stuff, it's tunnel time. I'm keen, I'm excited. I'm ready for our squad to be chased through this tunnel by a massive horde of demons. Maybe we fight the giant purple Oni as we go while siege turtles have to break the walls down or something. My mind is racing. I'm hoping for a very high intensity, high, oh, okay. Our first task is to break down the wall. Okay, how do we do that? Well, we collect these energy bubbles on our turtles to charge the explosives. But like, couldn't we just break them down with the the, the siege turret? I mean, we just, uh, okay, whatever, let's do this. Uh, we race around the cavern collecting bubbles and blow up the wall. Cool, let's proceed. More bubbles. Hmm, okay, this again. All right, fine. Uh, it's feeling a little more cramped in this section, but let's get it done. Oh, okay, there's one little Oni. I guess we'll just squish it on our turtles. After we do a couple more rounds of collecting bubbles and charging the explosives, boom, next room. Please, for the love of God, don't be, uh-oh, it's more bubbles. By this point, I'm thinking, where are the enemies? I have a friend in my gunner seat, but he's got nothing to shoot. We clumsily make our way up this cavern once again, collecting bubbles, charging the explosives. There's literally just a stack of turtles sitting at the battery because you have to wait to like charge the battery with the bubbles you've collected. You gotta wait like 10 seconds just sitting here. Bombs go off. But dear viewer, there is yet another room with nothing in it. 
Not a single Oni. And we once again awkwardly race our way to the end, collecting bubbles and smashing crystals, idling at the wall, waiting for the battery to charge. This is it. This is the tunnel event we've been waiting for. I was gobsmacked, but it doesn't end there. Surely, surely the final boss would be a little more... Oh God, it's bubbles again. You collect bubbles, which you can only do on your giant, slow, cumbersome siege turtle, and then carefully walk your way up a thin railway to get up to the battery to charge it. But you can't charge it while there are enemies around, so you gotta kill those on your turtle. But they also spawn almost as fast as you could kill them on your turtle, but you can't get off your turtle, or you can't charge the battery. Once it's charged, you pick up a rifle from the ground and use the one-off ability to break the boss's shield. But now it's time to fight the bo- Oh wait, no, we just fight a few static avoid blobs that deal basically no damage to you whatsoever. Okay, blobs are dead. Time to fight the- Nope, it's bubble time again. You do this. Not once, not twice, but three, sometimes four times, and then the boss dies after we literally just did the same thing in the tunnel another four times. Nothing different happens between the phases. Uh, the void bubbles don't do anything extra. I cannot fathom the decisions made in this last leg of the meta event. Now look, I'm all for making the siege turtles useful. I spoke in the last video about how much I enjoyed using them to break down the walls. But when faced with the walls in the tunnel, you do not use the siege turtles for their weaponry. You use them as slow, clunky bubble collectors in an environment that is clearly not designed for these giant mounts with slow turning circles. And then you repeat that mechanic like eight times until the end of the event. Guild Wars 2 combat is great. It is the main reason that I return to this game regularly when I'm tired of other MMOs. It's at its best when it takes advantage of all our tools available. Our blocks, movement, dodges, CC, condition cleanse, all these things. The last half of this meta event uses absolutely none of that because you are glued to your siege turtles, otherwise you cannot do the mechanics. Rewards. Let's talk about rewards. What is your reward for this almost hour long meta event? After the boss dies, uh, as usual, you loot some chests at the body. Did not realize that there were now chests spawned throughout the tunnel, so uh, we gotta go back down the tunnel hunting for all these little chests. You get the usual loot from these chests. It's materials, unidentified gear, there's a chance of some skins that sell for a gold each. There's still that rare chair drop, I guess. The rewards haven't really changed since the last time we talked about the meta event. There's a recolor of the weapon set from the last patch and a new ascended armor set, which is the same across all weights. I thought that this maybe was a super easy way of getting a full ascended set of gear but the collection is actually kind of expensive each piece will run you over like 20 gold but at least there's an alternative there if you don't like crafting you don't like raiding or in any instance content you can get some reasonably priced ascended gear here and that's it that's the patch. There are some new adventures and races in the End of Dragon zones, which is nice. Uh, some of them open up in Gala as well when the meta event is completed. They're okay, but yeah, not really my thing. No unique rewards attached to them or anything. I imagine you'll just do them once, try to get gold, and then move on and never touch them again. Now, they announced in the last blog post that the new Fractal wasn't arriving until a month after this patch, so I was already prepared for that going into it, but it definitely adds to the sting. I think had there been some addition of instanced content to do, I'd feel a little differently about this patch on release. But yeah, um, I think just overall, not the quality of content I expect coming from ArenaNet uh, in regards to the meta event and the map and whatnot. I know we like to meme them a lot, but no, I really do hold ArenaNet to a high standard, especially when it comes to maps and meta events, because I think that's where they typically shine. 
Not so here, though. Uh, this is definitely not ArenaNet's finest hour. And I am just hoping that this isn't the standard moving forward for post-expansion or even expansion content. They had this little Q&A thing in their last blog post with one question along the lines of, is Giala Delve what we can expect moving forward? To which they replied with, that was delivered in a short period, but we're already working on the post-expansion content for the next expansion or something like that. And that response is great and all, but it doesn't really answer the question of, is this the standard moving forward? And I suspect it's a question a lot of us are asking ourselves after these two patches. They smartly teased on Twitter that something would be dropping summer 2023 to set up a new threat. And yeah, I mean, that's just in the next few months. So it's likely this is the next expansion launch. Fingers crossed this is not just an announcement for an announcement of the expansion. And this is the actual expansion launch. If that's the launch window, then we should be hearing some info about the expansion in like the next couple months, perhaps even, you know, when the fractal drops. Even though my expectations are kind of tempered by the fact that we know these expansions will now be about half the size of the usual ones as a trade off for them being yearly releases, uh, I'm counting on ArenaNet to put their best foot forward here because these last two patches were not it, unfortunately. Uh, now I'll leave on a positive note though, uh, I am quite excited for the June 27th patch that we'll be getting because we'll be getting a significant class balance update alongside the new Fractal, so we'll see how that goes. No doubt I'll be covering those in some capacity. I'm actually very excited for that, that balance patch because it seems like they'll be tackling issues surrounding supports, which, you know, I've had a problem with for a long time. So I'm very excited to see how that shakes up gameplay. Weirdly enough, I'm still cautiously optimistic for the future of Guild Wars 2. I'm keen for a more consistent update cadence, but I just hope that it doesn't come at the cost of lower quality content. We'll see. We're going to find out pretty soon. Anyway, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, go ahead and click the like button eight times just for good measure. And as always, I'll catch you later.